Good? As long as you're doing good by the time you leave, that would be good. So we're glad you guys are here. Anybody that's new, welcome. Uh, we hope that you feel at home and that you enjoy the service here today. If you would, go ahead and break out your bulletins here. Just a couple quick announcements to go over. Today, uh, we have youth group from 2 to 4. That'll be right here in the sanctuary. So all the youth age kids, make sure to come back from 2 to 4. And we'll have some fun games and snacks and just a good time. So make sure to do that. And then another reminder for the pastor's conference. That is coming up uh, February 21st to the 23rd. There's our little slide there. You can see the theme is Standing Strong in Jesus. Guys, I really want to, want to encourage you again, if, if the, at any way possible, make a way to go to this conference. It's really good. And it's a good time of fellowship. And we'll have a small group there representing Calvary Chapel, Crystal River. So I'd like it to grow into a bigger group. So mark it on your calendars. Make a way to go. It's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. A lot of great teaching. Usually what we do is we leave from church. Uh, just a group goes over and leaves from church. We get checked in and we'll go out to dinner on Sunday night. And it's just a really good time. And, and you'll be encouraged. You'll be refreshed. So make it a point to go. Okay. And then we have uh, an insert here for the Christmas Eve service. That's just a couple weeks away. So that will be on Christmas Eve at 5 p.m. And we will still have church the following Sunday, a couple days after that. So make sure to note that. Uh, but we have our Christmas Eve service at 5 p.m. Child care is provided for children five and under. Uh, over five, they'll be in here with us. It's a shorter service, and we do the candlelight service. And It'll be a special time, so make sure you come out uh, on 5 p.m. on Thursday, New or Christmas Eve, okay? Then, if you'll notice, there's a blank index card. Does everybody have a blank index card? What I'd like for you to do before you leave today is put your name and your phone number and your email address on here and drop it in the offering box there in the back by the Bibles. And the purpose for that is because we're trying to get our church directory in order and so we've got a lot of new faces since we last did this so we need to update it so make sure to fill out the information okay put it in the offering box right there in the back on the way out and that way we can stay in contact with each other and if there's any needs we can reach out and just be a family right a reminder home fellowship is uh, no more through the end of this year because of the holidays. And so anybody who's interested in maybe hosting a home fellowship starting next year, get with me, let me know. Uh, ideally, we'd have a couple spread out around the er different areas and so people don't have to travel far for home fellowship. And uh, so if you have that on your heart, let me know. Even if you're not in a position where you'd like to lead the Bible study, if you just would like to host the home fellowship, that would be great. Let us know. We've got plenty of teachers, and we can, we can work that out, okay? So get with me, and maybe we can try and get that going by the beginning of the year, okay? And that's all I've got. So I'm going to pray, and we're going to get into worship. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for this church family, and just what an awesome blessing it is to be able to come here and to enjoy fellowship with each other and to glorify your name. Lord, I pray that you would move in this place today, that you would uh, just touch the hearts of the people that are here. Lord, we know that you meet us right where we're at. So God, I ask that you would give us the ability to just lay everything down at your feet, Lord, and, and just receive from you today. God, we love you so much. We're so thankful for your goodness. We're so thankful for the way that you provide for us and the great length that you've gone for us, Lord, to bring us here today. Lord, we know that you have something specifically uh, for each of us today, Lord. And so I pray that we would be ready to receive from you today, Lord. God, we love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and stand or sit, whatever you'd like to do.
herald angels sing glory to the newborn king peace on earth and mercy my god and sin is reconciled joyful all ye nations rise join the triumph of the sky with angelic hosts proclaim christ is born in bethlehem hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king with the heaven-born prince of peace hail the son of righteousness light and light to all he brings risen with healing in his hands while he lay his glory by born that man poor may die born to raise the sons of earth King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come now. Let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? strong to say in your mighty name King of heaven come Christ by highest heaven adore Christ the everlasting Lord Day in time behold him come offspring of the virgin He lays his glory by for that man no more may die born to raise the sons of earth born to give him second birth hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn newborn king king of heaven come down king of heaven come now glory reign shining like the day king of heaven come King of heaven, rise up, who can stand against us? You are strong to say in your mighty name, King of heaven, come. Let your kingdom come here. Let your will be done here in us. Jesus, there is no one greater. You alone are Savior. Show the world your love. Come on, let's all cry out to him. The King of Heaven, come down. The King of Heaven, come down. Let your glory reign, shining light. 
like the day the King of Heaven comes. King of Heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? You are strong to save in your mighty name. King of Heaven, come. Children of your mercy, rescued for your glory, we cry, Jesus, set our hearts towards you, every eye would see you, lifted high. King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come down. Let your glory ring, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? are strong to say in your mighty name King of heaven come and sing King of heaven come King of heaven come King of heaven come Oh we need you Jesus I love you, 
Sing that out one more time, every voice. Let's sing it really loud. Let's bless him this morning. And I love, I love, I love your presence. I love, I love, I love your presence. I love, I love, I love you, Jesus. I love, I love. sing that one more time, but I just want to encourage you guys with the truth that His presence is a, is a tangible thing that we can experience to some degree here on this earth right now. We can have communion and fellowship with Him, but we can't work our way to His presence, but the truth is that the veil has been torn already because of the sacrifice of Jesus that we can come boldly approaching the throne of grace we can come into his presence and and minister to him but also be ministered to by his presence when we get to sit into his presence together it's there's healing in his presence psalm 16 says that in his presence is fullness of joy fullness of hope fullness of peace and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore so I want to sing that one more time with that truth that His presence is here right now and it's available. And and then let's just spend some time sitting in His presence together. I love, I love I love Your presence
pray for every heart in this room that what we just sang would be true, Lord, that you would be everything to us. Lord, as, as Roman 12 says, that we would offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to you, Lord, that every part of our life would be surrendered to you, Lord. Lord, we, we know in our minds that you are worthy to have all of our lives, and we want to surrender our lives to you. We want to live totally for you, but sometimes it it's, stays in our minds, and it doesn't really jump into our heart where we actually do it. I just pray this morning that you would really help us, Lord, to move from the head to the heart just to really surrender our lives to you. Holy Spirit, you would help us to do that. Help us to live every day for you, to just love you more. Lord, we, again, just thank you for this time in your presence. Just pray for the rest of the service that you continue to be here ministering to us and keep us open to receive your word now. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys say good morning to each other.
Good morning, good morning. Let's have a seat. It's good to see you guys this morning. It's sweet to worship with you. Uh, thank you to Jack. Jack, right here. He's not here right now, but he was standing right here. He is visiting us from Calvary Chapel, Lexington, South Carolina. So uh, if you get a chance, meet Jack. Thank him for being here. Thank him for being a part of the worship team this morning. It's a blessing to have him. It's, man, when we get to worship together, that's a sweet thing. It's an amazing, eternal thing. It's something that we're sending forward into eternity, right? And you think about all the things you do on a daily basis, all the temporal things that fade away, uh, that have no real eternal weight or value. But worship is one of those things that it has eternal weight and value. The halls of he heaven echo with our worship, right? It's a sweet-smelling aroma before the throne of God. It ministers unto Him. And so it's, it, it's, a, it's a special thing that we get to do. It's a privilege. Worship is a privilege. It's not just something that we do when we come together. We just sing songs to waste 30 minutes of service, right? To make sure everybody can get here uh, before the message starts. But worship is a, it's a sweet Sweet time. That's exactly what it is. It's worship. We are worshiping the king of heaven. We're worshiping the God who upholds heaven and earth, right? The alpha and the omega. We get to come before him. And you know what's amazing? Sean mentioned it is that the veil is torn. The veil was rent from top to bottom, which means the holy of holy was, was open to anyone to look in. The Holy of Holies is open now. The presence of God is open and we can come boldly to the throne room of grace. We can come before him and call him Father. That's wild. That's a privilege. That's an amazing, amazing honor that we have as the children of God, the redeemed by the blood of Jesus, that we get to enter into the presence of the Almighty. With an unveiled face, we can look upon him in his glory and call him Father. That's awesome. And we shouldn't take it lightly, right? We should invest in worship. And, and so with that in mind, I want to pray for the service. I want to pray for the Bible study. Does anybody need a Bible before we get involved, before we go? If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Somebody will bring you one. I promise I won't call you out. Everybody has a Bible this morning? It's important to me that you have a Bible so that you can follow along. You can, right here. I didn't say their name. It's important that you have one so that you know I'm not just giving you my opinion, right? So that you know this is the eternal word of God. So that you can hold me accountable to the word. You can search the scriptures to see whether or not what I'm saying is true. It's important that you have one follow along with me, right? Okay, we're going to be in Romans chapter 12. But before we jump into it, with that idea of worship in mind, I would like to just pray. And I would like for you guys to set your hearts on worship, right? We've been worshiping the Lord, uh, but we're not done worshiping him. Just because the last song is over, right? We continue to have this heart of worship as we study his word. We worship him through the hearing of his word. We worship him as he speaks to us through his eternal word. Remember, heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will by no means pass away. It is written in heaven. Forever we will learn of it, right? And so let's have our hearts tuned in to worship this morning. Let's worship him through the hearing of his word. You guys pray with me. Uh, Lord, thank you for this privilege. God, to be called your sons and your daughters. Lord, thank you for the privilege that we have to enter in. Uh, Lord, to, to look at you face to face. Lord, to seek you, uh, to hear from you this morning. Father, I pray for this Bible study, uh, that your Holy Spirit would be here. Lord, that it would anoint this service. Uh, Father, that you would speak to us and teach us your word. Lord, we know that you are the teacher. Uh, Father, I pray that you would use me this morning as just a tool in your hand. Lord, just a vessel of your grace. Lord, would you speak to your people? Would you bless them this morning? Uh, Lord, help me to get out of your way. Uh, just use me as a conduit, Father. Uh, speak to our hearts this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Romans chapter 12. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. If you're not there already. Uh, remember last week we made it all the way through verse 8. And so we're going to pick up in verse 9. But before we do, uh, I want to just remind you of what uh, we've been studying what the context is, where we're at, what's going on in the book of Romans, okay? 
So we've moved from the doctrinal aspect of the book of Romans. Not, not as if there is no doctrine to be formed in Romans 12 to the end of, of the book. Of course there is. But we've moved into the more practical application section of the book of Romans. And so if you're starting today uh, in Romans chapter 12, I want you to know that there are 11 other chapters before Romans chapter 12. I think we covered that last week so that everyone knows that. Romans 12 is not the beginning of the book, right? And so, working our way through the first 11 chapters, Paul has been giving us some very amazing insight into the heart of God. He's been giving us uh, amazing doctrinal truths that are available to us through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we have now been redeemed from this sin nature that we were once in. In Romans chapter 1, Paul says he's not ashamed of the gospel... For it is the power of God unto salvation for anyone who would believe. That it has the saving power to anyone who would believe. The gospel. What is the gospel? It's the good news, right? It's the good news that Jesus, the King of heaven, the God who upholds heaven and earth, he stepped down from eternity and he died in our place. He took all the weight, all the punishment of our sin. He took that upon himself on the cross. He paid in full the debt that we could never pay. And now, as a result, all the debt that we owed has been paid. And so now, by faith, we get to enter into this new covenant. We get to enter into justification. It's only by faith. It's not by anything we've done. It's not by any uh, good deeds or anything that we could do to earn it. But it's been given to us freely without a cause. It's been given to us freely because of the great love with which he loved us. By grace you've been saved through faith. It's an amazing reality, right? And so then he walks us through this salvation that we now have in him. This righteousness that we now have in him. This imputed righteousness. Now... I know, I know you guys have heard this a million times. You've heard me say it over and over and over again as we've studied the book of Romans, but it's important that you hear it again. And I'm going to probably continue to say it until we get done with the book of Romans. And then when we move forward, I'll say it again and again, and I'll just remind you of that over and over and over and over again, right? That we, in and of ourselves, are not now righteous. That's not what happened. God didn't make you righteous, if that were true, you would never do anything wrong ever again. You would be righteous. You would be perfect. You would, be, you would have a perfect right standing in and of yourself before a holy God, and you would do everything right. Now, you live with yourself. I don't live with you, so I don't know. Maybe you do that. But I know for myself, I don't. I fall short daily. But what the Lord did was he gave me his righteousness. He imputed righteousness to me. He credited his righteousness to my account. So that when the Father looks at me from heaven, by faith he sees the righteousness of his Son in me, on me, through me. He finds me perfectly suited and and grounded, uh, grounded in his Son. That's where he finds me. That's where I am. I'm in Jesus. That's where he sees me. Not according to my own righteousness, thank God, because I would fall short daily. I would fall away from him every day before breakfast. I would be in trouble, right? But the truth is that I have now been credited his righteousness. His unfailing, perfect righteousness. Justified by his grace. That means just as if I'd never sinned, right? Imputed his righteousness. So when the father looks at me, he sees his own son's righteousness in me. He's been walking us through that reality. He gives us examples of that, that God's plan throughout the ages in Abraham, the promise that he made to him. Abraham believed the promise, and it was what? Credit to him as righteousness. His faith in the promise, not in his belief in God, but his belief in the promise that God made him. Now, interestingly, the promise that God makes Abraham is of this seed that would come through the lineage of Abraham, and through this seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. That's the promise of the Messiah that he makes to Abraham. Abraham believed that promise, and it was credited to him as righteousness. The same promise that you now believe, only looking back at the fulfillment of that in Jesus, it's the same promise that you now believe That is credit to you as righteousness. It's always been by faith from the foundation of the world that God would save his people by faith. It's always been that. Paul walks us through that. He gives us the reality of all these things. And then he shows us the depth of his own heart and the brokenness that he still has. In Romans chapter 7 he says that all the good things I want to do I don't do. And all the bad things that I don't want to do those are the things that I do. Oh wretched man that I am. Who can save me from this body of death? What is the answer? 
It's Jesus. It's Jesus. All the way back in Romans chapter 5, Paul says that, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And so all of that leading up to Romans chapter 8, this great crescendo of the doctrinal section of the book of Romans, he says that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. There's no condemnation. The only condemnation that comes is the condemnation that we heap on ourselves, right? Or the enemy puts on us or the world puts on us. But no condemnation comes upon us from the Father because he can't condemn his Son and we are found in his Son. We're freed from the condemnation that comes from sin. We're freed from the condemnation that comes through transgression, the guilt that we have, the debt that we owe. We're freed from all of that. We get to walk freely now in His grace, in the light of Christ, rescued from darkness, placed in the kingdom of the light of His Son. Amazing. And then he deals in Romans 9, 10, and 11 uh, with his eternal plan for uh, Jerusalem, for Israel, for his people, for his chosen people. That he hasn't cast them off. He still has a plan for them. We're living now in the dispensation of grace, the church age, as the Lord is building and redeeming for himself a bride. But soon and very soon when we're called home, he turns his attention again back to Israel. And then we come to Romans chapter 12. Now Romans chapter 12, we've, we've gone through the first eight verses, but I'm going to read them again so we remember where we are, okay? But with all of the, the previous uh, chapters of the book of Romans in mind, we come to this section with a therefore, right? He's pointing back. He says, therefore, I beg you, therefore, in light of all of these truths, in light of all of this doctrine, in light of all of these amazing things that we've now been reading about, that he's been communicating to us through the Holy Spirit, in light of all of those things, I'm begging you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him, which is your reasonable act of service. So in light of all the things that the Lord has done for us, the only logical way to worship him is to give him our whole lives, our whole bodies, everything we have. Everything. He's given you eternity and perfection with him. He's given you freedom from the debt that you owed. He's given you life eternal in perfection. What should you give him in return? Listen, anything that you could give him, anything that you have to give him pales in comparison to what he's given you. It doesn't equal up. It doesn't measure up. So our only logical response is to give him everything. It's all his anyway. Everything we have has been given to us from him. Every good gift is from the Lord anyway. It's all his. Trust him with it. And so he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, But all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, He who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. I love this. This quick exhortation by Paul saying, look, the Lord has redeemed you, but he's redeemed you for a purpose, to function as a member of a body, right? Us being many members, one body, we all have specific roles within the body of Christ, and he's gifted you uh, gifts according to his will. He's given you emphasis and gifts according to the will of God, right? Now listen, we talked about this last week, but what good is a gift if you don't use it? I shared with you an illustration, just a quick illustration of um, our house, right? We have four kids, uh, four sons, a fifth on the way. We live in a little house, okay? And all of our kids have way too much stuff, like way too much stuff. If you were asked them, they would say that that's not true, but I'm telling you, they have way too much. They have so many 
presents, so many gifts, so many toys, that when Christmas comes, they get so much more because they have uh, crazy grandparents. <laughs> Everybody is looking at my mom. It's true. They give them way too much, and they're so overwhelmed with all of their gifts that guess what happens? Some of them never even get opened. And months will go by, and the kids are playing with all their gifts from Christmas, and we'll find unopened gifts in their closet or laying around somewhere, stuff that they never even took out of the box. What good is the gift if you don't use it? Now listen, if you think of that in light of a body, what good is a member if it's not being used? What good is a member if it's not walking in and doing its function that it's been given by God to do? You guys know about my toe if you were here last week. My toe is, serves me no purpose. It's no good. It doesn't do anything. What good is a toe that doesn't work, right? What good is a gift if it's not being used? And, and listen, it's not only for you. What good is the gift for you if you don't use it? But the body suffers if you're not using your gift. The body suffers if you're not walking in what the Lord has equipped you to do. And so Paul is exhorting us, look, whatever your gifting is, use it. Use it. It was given to you for a reason. The Lord desires that you use it. Now, don't use that as an excuse not to do anything that isn't according to your gift, because that's not how that works. Oh, no, I can't do that. That's not my gifting. I've heard that before. No, our role is to be servants, right? Our role is to have a servant's heart ready to serve at the drop of a hat to do whatever we can do. The Lord will equip us for it. But yeah, he's given us gifts. We should use them. And then in verse 9, he says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Listen, that's important for us to hear. Let love be without hypocrisy. The word there, love, is agape. Now, you guys are probably familiar with that word because you're students of the word, right? You're Calvary Chapel people. You know the word. You study the Bible. The word agape is one of the four words for love in the Greek language. And that word agape is a specific type of love. Now, people will um, define it as godly love. I, don't, I think that's a poor definition. That is the way God loves, by the way. But I think it's a poor definition of that word. And the reason why it's a poor definition of that word is it gives you uh, the idea that only God can love like that. Except we're commanded to let our agape not be with hypocrisy. Let it be without hypocrisy. And so what does the word agape mean? It's first an act of the will. It, it's a choice, right? It's an act of the will accompanied by emotion, and it leads to action on behalf of the one that is loved. Okay, so agape leads to action. It is first an act of the will. It's a choice to love. Let love be without hypocrisy. The self-sacrificial love. Putting your own needs to the back burner while you serve the needs of others. And let it be without hypocrisy. Now what does that word hypocrisy mean? I think we use it a lot and I think we use it a lot out of context. We don't know the exact meaning sometimes of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy often will be described as somebody who says one thing but does another, right? You're saying, uh, don't do this, while you in your private life are doing that. That's not really the definition of hypocrisy. The definition of hypocrisy, uh, really we get the word from acting, right? But really what hypocrisy is, is that I tell you not to do something, I do it and say it's okay for me to do it but not you. That would be hypocrisy, right? Now, if I'm falling short and I have some duplicity in my life and I'm telling you not to do something and I fall, slip, and stumble and do the same thing that I'm telling you not to do, but I recognize in my own life that it's all so wrong, that I shouldn't have done it, man, I messed up, here I am falling short again, that's not hypocrisy. That's just me being a human, right? Let love be without hypocrisy. That means make the choice to love even when you don't feel like it. Make the choice to live in such a way that would serve the people of the body of Christ, that would serve the people around you, and don't be acting. Don't be phony. Let yourself actually love people. Actually put your own needs aside for a minute and really love the people around you. Serve them. Listen, often when we're suffering, when we're feeling down, when we're depressed, it's often because we're too focused on ourselves. Now listen, I don't mean that there is no suffering and no depression, no anxiety, none of those things. I, I believe that they really are real. 
But often we're so focused, inwardly focused on ourselves and what's going wrong with us and how we're not being served and we're missing out on what we could be doing for the people around us. And I think if we would turn our attention outward, often our suffering would fade away. We would forget to suffer. We would forget to be worried about ourselves because when we're so busy serving the people around us, esteeming them as higher than ourselves, that we don't have time to worry about our own needs, right? And listen, if we were all living that way, if everybody within the body of Christ was living like that, would there really ever be anyone whose needs weren't being fulfilled? If we were all looking for ways to serve each other's needs, all looking for ways to minister to each other, and we would stop worrying so much about ourselves, turn our attention outward, and start serving the people around us, if every single one of us lived like that, wouldn't everyone's needs be being met? Wouldn't everyone be ministered to? And so Paul is reminding us as Christians, look, let your love be without hypocrisy. Now, why is that so important? Why is it so important that we live in such a way that would be loving to the people around us? Because we're a testimony of the grace of God, right? We're ambassadors for Christ here on earth. Here on earth the Lord has left us here to be his ambassadors. As though God were pleading through us to show the world what Jesus looks like. To be a witness for Jesus. That's what we're here to do. And so if we're, if we're really doing that, if we're really loving others without hypocrisy, if we're really making the conscious decision to put our own needs aside and to serve the other people around us, to, to make a decision first, an act of the will to live in this way, it's a witness for Jesus. Now at least, listen, people know uh, phony when they see it. They know it. People know when you're acting like you're something that you're really not. They know it. They see it. And so, for us, what we have to do is to really make that choice today to live like this. I love that because agape is not really a feeling. I mean, there is feeling involved. It's, a company, it's, a, it's an act of the will accompanied by emotion. But often we'll say things like this, well, I just don't love these people. Or I just don't love them. Because we bought the lie of culture that love is like this feeling that you have to feel, this overwhelming emotional feeling that you feel. That's not what true love is. That's not what this love is. That's not the way that the Lord would call us to love each other and to love our bride. The Lord calls us to make a decision to love them, even when we don't feel like it. Even when we're not feeling it in the moment, we're called to love regardless. I think about Jesus, you know, when uh, he's with his disciples, and they go, they try to get away from the crowds, and they go up onto a mountain so that they can uh, just be alone together. And he sees the multitude coming, and the Lord looks at them, and he has compassion on them as sheep without a shepherd. Now, in the moment, he was tired. In the moment, he had been ministering all day. All of his disciples that were with him were tired. They were worn out. But the Lord decided to serve them in that moment. You know, Jesus was fully God, but he's also fully man. And so he got tired, he got hungry, he got wore out, just like we do. And yet, even in that, when everything in him probably wanted to just take a rest, and he saw the multitudes coming, he made a decision to love them. He made a decision to serve them. That's what agape is. And it's by this that we know love, that Jesus would lay down his life for us. That's what love looks like. To lay down your life for the brethren. Let love be without hypocrisy. And abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Abhor means to detest. To be disgusted by. Be disgusted by that which is evil. Now the specific word that it uses here of evil. There are two words that it uses in the New Testament of evil in the Greek. There are two words. One word is just evil in itself. Like just, there's just evil and it's just evil because of what it is. And then there's another word that's used here that is evil because it sucks you in. This word that's used here of evil is the only word that's ever used of Satan. When it describes evil. Abhor, detest, be disgusted by that which is evil that draws men in, that takes them captive. Now listen, we live in an age where the church, I would say not the true church, but the visible church, uh, 
is not only not doing this, but also making provision for that which is evil, accepting that which is evil, being okay with that which is evil. But listen, that is not loving. That's not loving. I heard something the other day that was pretty disturbing. It was a small child who said, uh, I don't even, I guess I can't really get into it specifically, not the specifics of it, but they were celebrating something that the Lord says is evil, that the Lord says is not good. Now, what, why is it that the Lord calls specific things evil in Scripture, especially this word for evil that draws men in? Why is it the Lord says to stay away from that, to detest it? It's not because it just makes him feel bad, but it's because it's not good for you. That's the purpose. The Lord always is giving us commandments, giving us instruction, because he loves us and want what's, wants what's best for us. And so he says, when he says to stay away from something, it's because he loves you and wants to protect you from that thing that will destroy you, that will suck you in, that will take over your life. And he's saying, instead of accepting and making provision for it, detest it. Don't be in the presence of it. Stay away from it because it has hooks and it will draw you in. Cling to what is good instead. Listen, in the world that we live in, that is not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to surround yourself with that which is good. And, and the fact is, you won't always be around that which is good. In fact, often you'll be around that which is evil. Which is why it's so important to be among the brethren. Which is why it's so important to be here, to be filled, to be sitting under the word of God, to be being filled by the spirit of God. To be encouraged by your brothers and sisters. To be prayed over. Because as you head out into the world, as you head out into the mission field, you are going to encounter that which is evil. And so he says, let, le let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor, detest what is evil and cling to what is good. Now what is good? What is good? How do we know what's good? How do we know what is evil and what is good? Well, I would say what is good is God. Jesus says only God is good, and, and he's right. Only God is good, right? And so whatever is evil is that which is not God. Everything that is good and godly, everything that is of God and his word and his church is good. Everything that is outside of that, that is contrary to it, is evil. Cling to what is good. Cling to his word. As we were talking about that this morning, talking about worship and his word and worshiping him through the hearing of his word. You know, as you study his word and the Lord gives you revelation, the, the longer and longer you study his word, the more and more you're in the word, the more and more you know of his character. We've talked about this before, but you learn a lot of really cool things in scripture. You learn a lot about history. Uh, you learn a lot about doctrine. You learn really good tips for living well, right? What is the most important thing you learn of in Scripture? God. You learn of him and his character. You learn of who he is. The world has a pretty skewed view of who he is. And in fact, they get to make up their own definitions all the time of who God is or what God is or you are God and we are God and we're all part of some collective universal consciousness that is God living itself out through individuals. That sounds silly, right, when we say it out loud? That's what the world would say about God. But let's see what God says about himself. It's here in scripture. Cling to what is good. Cling to his word. Listen, he has preserved his word for us for now over 2,000 years. It's the most well-attested. The New Testament itself is the most well-attested to work in all of antiquity. We have nothing like the New Testament. It's been so well preserved that we know exactly what the original writers wrote in the New Testament. It's right here for us. It's perfectly preserved throughout history. You think we should know it? You think we should read it? Not only should we know it and read it, but we should cling to it. We should hold on to it. We should bring it into ourselves, man. This is, this is the word of God. He has spoken to us from eternity. We should pick it up and hear of him. Let him teach us of himself. Let him teach us of who he is. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. 
not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, and continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Now, from verse 9 to 13, the Lord, the Holy Spirit, working through Paul, is telling us of our actions, the way we should act in the world, the way we should live. This is very practical, uh, everyday living for the Christian. This is how you should live. Now, verses 9 to 13 for me are easy. They're easy because I recognize that I don't do them right, but at least I have a list of things that I can attain to. I can have a list of things that I can do. Now, when we move from 14 through the end of the chapter, it gets much more difficult for me because that is no longer talking about our actions, but it's talking about the way we react or the way we respond to people and situations. That's much more difficult. And so in verse 9, I'm sorry, in verse 10 it says, this is what you should do as a Christian. Listen, brethren, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. And once you've done that, this is how you live as a Christian. Once you put your faith in Jesus and he's rescued you from the bondage of sin, he's brought you out of darkness, placed you in the light, set your feet on the rock of Jesus Christ, this is now how you should act and live in the world. Not so that you could earn salvation. Right? That's very important that you get that. It's very important that you understand doing these things will not make you a Christian. And so if you're in a place today where you're struggling with whether or not you're with the Lord or you're in the faith or you believe in Him or whatever it is, doing this list of things will not make you a Christian, will not save you. This is what we do because we're Christians. This is what we do in response to the salvation that we've received from the Lord. The fact that He has rescued us this is how we live in light of that. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. This brotherly love is another term. It's a different word. You're probably familiar with it. It's the word Philadelphia. It's literally the word Philadelphia, brotherly love. Now, if you go to Philadelphia, I don't know if they're doing this perfectly. I don't know. Never, never hung out there. I would imagine they're not. Maybe they are in the church. But it says to be kindly affectionate to one another. That's really what brotherly love, you guys know what brotherly love looks like. This friendship love where you would uh, lay down your life on behalf of your friends, where you would come alongside them in a difficult situation. You know how you know, how you know when somebody is your real friend? Is when something good happens for you, they're happy for you. And when something bad happens to you, they're sad with you or they're sad for you. That sounds like a really simplistic definition of friendship, right? But how often have you told somebody something good that has happened to you and they weren't happy for you? They were jealous or they just wished it could happen for them or, or they wanted to tell you about that one time something better than that happened to them. <laughs> has, that, has that ever happened for you, to you? It's happened to me. I've probably done it to others. But the exhortation for us, for the church, is to be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. Listen, look around. This is, these are, this is your family. These are your brothers and sisters. You're going to spend eternity with them. Forever. You're going to have to look at them Forever. You might as well start being nice to them now, right? You might as well start getting to know them now and be kindly affectionate to one another to develop a true friendship. Don't just show up to church to hear the message and leave. The most important ministry that happens in church, I'm stealing this from Damien Kyle, I think. The most important ministry that happens in church is the 30 minutes before and the 30 minutes after church. It's much more important than what I'm doing. When you guys get to know each other, when you pour into each other, when you love on one another, when you get to exercise the giftings that the Lord has given you towards the brethren, that's important. That's why it's important to me that you show up early. That's why it's important to me that we stay after, that we enjoy each other's fellowship, to be kindly affectionate to one another, to not just come in and go out and check off the box on the list, that like, yep, I was at church, I did it, I did exactly what I'm supposed to do, I'm a good Christian now. Oh, to love each other, to bear each other's burdens. You know, there are per people in this room who are hurting. 
There are people in this room who are going through difficult times. There are people in this room with all kinds of medical issues or with family who are hurting. Do you know that? Do you know what's going on with them? Have you prayed with them? You would be surprised how often you walk up to somebody and you say, hey, can I pray for you? Is there something I could pray for? And they'll drop just a bomb on you. And you didn't realize the burden that was on their heart. You didn't realize the heaviness that they were walking through. Listen, it's important as the church that we're doing that for each other. It's important that as the church we're being kindly affectionate towards one another because maybe this is the only place where someone can come to have some kindness in their life. Maybe this is the only group of people who are affectionate towards them. It's important that we do that. It's important that when you show up to, the, to church on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday evening or at one of the Bible studies that go on through the week, it's important that you come prayed up and ready to minister to the church. So often we get the wrong idea of what church is and we approach, that, we approach church with this kind of uh, consumer mentality where we're just looking for what the church can do to us or for us. We come into the church and we think, well, I like this place, but it's not, you know, the, they don't have a good light show. Their worship sounds good, but have you seen the lighting? Or, you know, they don't have a, a, a good enough youth ministry or a good enough children's ministry. I'm going to go find a place where they can minister to this one specific need that I have instead of looking at this as a body of broken people that you get to minister to, that you get to come in and use the gifting that the Lord has given you to bless the body of Christ. That's what church is. This right here on a Sunday morning, what this is, is the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. You get to be involved in that. You get to come alongside people who are stressed, who are broken, who are weary, and you get to bear their burdens with them. You get to put their arm around you and carry them for a little while. Because guess what's going to happen? Maybe not right now and maybe not next week, but there's going to be a time where you're weary and you need somebody to carry you. You're going to need somebody to bear your burden with you. Listen, that's why the Lord leaves us here. That's why he's building us together. That's why he says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You need to be together. And if it's a Sunday morning and that's it, that's not enough. You need to be surrounded with people who are like-minded, who love you, who want to serve you, who want to bless you, who want to just speak the word of God over you who want to just encourage you. Listen, guys, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. I I, I know that you guys know that. Something that has blessed me so much from being a part of this body, from being a part of this fellowship, and really, I am so spoiled because I come from a a fellowship in Palm Harbor. That's really my only background, my only uh, real church experience. I've been to churches throughout my life, but I never really was a churchgoer until I went to Calvary Chapel, Palm Harbor, and that is a fellowship who loves. It's a fellowship who loves each other. And so then, when we started this work, the Lord has brought people, and what's so cool is there are people who are here from all kinds of backgrounds, and when they come, they say, wow, you guys really love each other, or you guys really believe this, or this is the kindest church that I've ever been a part of. When I hear those things, you have no idea how that blesses me as a pastor. You have no idea how amazing that is. And so I know that you guys know this. You know the importance of this, the importance of fellowship, and the importance of loving each other. In honor, giving preference to one another. And that goes right back to what Paul was saying. Let none of you think too highly of yourself, more highly than you ought to, but give preference to one another. Now, that just really is just cementing what I said earlier. If we were all just living in such a way that we were preferring one another before ourselves and we were ministering to each other, if I were just looking out for the needs of all the people in the church and not really worried about my own and everybody was doing that, my needs would be met as well as yours, right? So, don't think too highly of yourself, but in contrast, in honor, give preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, 
fervent in spirit. I love that. Fervent. That word fervent really means like boiling over. Boiling over in the spirit. With excitement in the spirit. Be filled with the spirit so much that it's boiling over. Listen, I love being around Christians like that. Christians who are fervent in spirit, that are on fire for the Lord, that are just ready and willing to serve, ready and willing to do whatever the Lord would ask them to do, just excited to be walking with him in the spirit. I want to be around Christians like that because it holds me accountable to my actions. He's saying this is what we should be. Not blasé or apathetic to what the Lord is doing, but fervent in the spirit. Fervent in the spirit. Serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Now listen, if you are fervent in the Spirit, not lagging in diligence, but fervent in the Spirit, then you'll do all of these next things. If you're letting the Holy Spirit so fill you that you're bubbling over with Him, that you're boiling over with fervency in the Spirit, then you're going to be serving the Lord. You can't help it. It's a fire in your bones. You have to do what the Lord has called you to do. You have to do what he's asking you to do because the Holy Spirit won't leave you alone about it. He's just burning in you and you have to do what he's asking you to do. So if you're fervent in the Spirit, you'll be serving the Lord, there's no doubt. Now if you're not serving the Lord, maybe you're not fervent in the Spirit. Fervent in the Spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. That's important, guys, rejoicing in hope. Now, in the Greek, there is a definite article before hope, so it would read something like this. Rejoicing in the hope. In the hope, in the blessed hope. The hope of the resurrection, the hope of eternity, the hope that now we've been rescued from our sin and we have forever together with the Lord. Rejoice in that. Listen, no matter what is going on in your life, no matter how hard things are, no matter how, uh, how much pressure you're under at work or in your personal life or in your marriage or whatever it is, you have reason to rejoice. If you're a believer in Jesus, you should be rejoicing. Rejoicing in the hope. That, listen, the blessed hope is that now we have peace with God. That now we have fellowship offered to us. Perfect koinonia fellowship. Sharing of things in common. You get to share things in common with a God that there is nothing else in the universe like. Is that, do, you, do you hear what I'm saying? Do you understand what that means? That nothing in the universe is like God and yet you get to share things in common with him. What would you have in common with God if there's nothing in the universe like him? You have nothing in common with him except for the fact that now his son lives in you. That now you've been rescued and redeemed by his blood. You've been given a right standing before a holy God. Now you can have fellowship with him. You can have communion with him. You can have a relationship with God. It's available to you today, right now. And maybe you're in that place where you know those things or you've heard it for a long time, but you've never actually experienced it. You've never actually entered into a true and genuine, tangible relationship with a holy God. It's available today. All you have to do is ask. All you have to do is ask, and he'll meet you right where you are. Rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation. Every time I read this, it makes me think of Pastor Jim. Patient in tribulation. That word patient is hoopamony. It means to bear up under the weight of the pressure, right? When pressure is on you. When, when, when the tribulation of the world is pressing down on you and the persecution from your workplace or the trouble that you're walking in in your personal life, whatever it is, the temptation that you're facing, when you feel like it's pressing down on you, he says to be patient, hoopamony. It, it really gives the idea of uh, endurance. Not patient like twiddling your thumbs in the doctor's office and not losing your cool because it's taking longer than your appointment time. Not that patience. The patience, the endurance that it would take to run a marathon and to run it well and to win. That's what it's talking about here. Be patient. Patient in tribulation and continuing steadfastly in prayer. Because of what Jesus has done for us, he's opened up this avenue for us to have fellowship and to have conversation together with our Lord. That's what prayer is. It's us just coming to him and talking to him like you would talk to your father because he is your father. You just get to have a conversation with him. You talk to him and then you listen because he's talking back to you. That's prayer. 
continue steadfastly in it. Be patient in tribulation when all the weight of the world is pushing down and you have endurance and it's because of the hope that you have that you can rejoice in the midst of it. Now, we have nine minutes. Distributing to the needs of the saints and given to hospitality. We talked about giving last week a little bit. I don't like to talk about giving because there are a lot of people who are uh, hurt by the church in all kinds of ways. I remember uh, once I went to a church and they did an altar call. And so I went down to receive the Lord, which is what you do at an altar call, right? You go down to receive the Lord at an altar call. They say, anybody who needs to be saved, come down here. So I came. And they made us all line up at the altar and get down on our knees and they prayed over us. And the pastor of the church came over and prayed over me. He never said anything about Jesus or salvation or anything. He just told me that the Lord was going to give me lots of money, tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars were going to come through my hand because I was going to be a faithful giver to my church. And I was pumped about it because I didn't know the Lord. <laughs> I, didn't know, I didn't know Jesus at all. So I was like, yes, that's exciting. That's what I'm excited about. That, I knew I should come to church today. <laughs> but listen, I don't, so I don't like to talk about giving for reasons like that because everybody has a story, right? But ultimately, we should be giving to the Lord, not to the church. Listen, if you're putting an offering in the box back there because you want to give to the needs of this church and pay the light bill and all that, please stop giving. I don't want you to give for that reason. I want you to give to the Lord because it's an act of worship. You're worshiping him with every part of your life. Remember, giving your bodies over as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. In light of the mercies of God, give your life to him. Every part of your life, not just the things that are easy, but the things that are really difficult. And you want to see something that's really difficult for a person, start messing with their bank account. That's really difficult for people. But here he says that we as Christians should be distributing to the needs of the saints. Listen, if you have the goods of this world and you don't give them, are you, really loving, are you really loving your brother? If somebody comes to you and has a need and you have something to fulfill that need and you don't give it, but you say, go, just be warm and be filled, but you don't give them what they need, are you loving them? No. As Christians, we should be marked by our giving hearts, by the way we desire to bless the people around us, by the way we desire to distribute to the needs of the saints around us, especially to those who are of the household of faith, the saints of God, those who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. We should be giving to the needs of the saints. Now, that doesn't mean just physical things. That doesn't mean just monetarily. But give to them what you have. Give to them from your gifting. Give to them from what the Lord has equipped you with. Listen, if you would just try it, just step out in faith. Say, okay, Lord, I know that you've asked me to do this. I haven't done it up to this point. I'm afraid to, but Lord, I'm gonna trust you and I'm gonna do it. Watch what he does. I've shared this with you guys before, but not all of you, so bear with me. I am deathly afraid of public speaking. I'm not kidding. I'm, this, this is like a phobia. It's my greatest fear. I don't even like saying I'm afraid of anything, okay? But snakes and public speaking, that, they get me. I dropped out of college. I barely graduated high school, by the way. I dropped out of college my first semester, like two days into my first semester of college, because I had to take a, a course on public speaking. It was a required course. And I had to take a course on public speaking. And in that course, they said that every class I was going to have to give a five-minute speech about my week. So I dropped out of college and I never went back because there's no way I was going to do that until the Lord called me to do this and called me totally outside of my comfort zone. And I remember the first time I had an opportunity to teach, and I think that was because of Ryan in the back telling people that, telling my pastor that he should give me an opportunity. But anyway, they, I got my first opportunity to teach and I got a, it was a group text between me and two other guys that said, hey, we were thinking having you younger guys teaching at the next men's conference. What do you think? And so me, being a pretty new Christian at the time, did what I thought was the holy thing to do. And I told them I would pray about it. And then right after I said I would pray about it, the other two guys said, yep, I'm in. Yep, I'm in right away. So I was like, well, now I'm stuck. I got to do it. And so I said yes. 
And all the way leading up to that, all the way leading up to that day, for like six months, I was dying inside myself every day that it got closer until the night before. I'm going over my notes with Chayla the night before and losing it. Like, why did I agree to this? What was I thinking? There's no way I can do this. I'm going to be in a room with people who know so much more. And then I taught, and I have no idea what I said. I don't remember how it went. All I know is that when I got down, I knew that that's what the Lord had created me to do was just to teach his word. It doesn't matter if I was good at it or not. This is what he wanted me to do, so I'm going to be willing, Lord. Whatever you ask me, I'll do it. I'll do it. And so distribute what you have to the needs of the saints. They have needs, and you've been gifted in all kinds of specific ways to fulfill those needs. Be willing. Be willing to do what he's asked you to do. And given to hospitality. That's where we're going to end. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. And so think about what the Lord has been saying to us through these verses. 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. He's been giving us just this practical application. Just telling us what we should be doing. That this is what we should look like as the Christians who are walking around in this earth. As those left behind to be ministers of the gospel. To be ministers of the gospel of grace, to preach to the people who are around us. This is what the Lord has asked us to do. And he says at the end that we should be, as Christians, given over, giving our lives over to what? Hospitality. Listen, some people have a specific gifting for hospitality and they're great at it. But other people it's very difficult for. But guess what? You don't have an excuse, the Lord has said, to be given to hospitality. Now listen, as a church, guys, as a church... I want to be known as a church that is given to hospitality. I want to be known as a church that when someone visits, they say, wow, that church was really genuinely excited I was there. I felt loved while I was there. I felt like a part of their family. I felt like I belonged. I want people to feel that way. So listen, if it's difficult for you, good. It should be. David said, I'll never give the Lord anything that costs me nothing. That means to do something for the Lord should be difficult. It should cost you something. And so if there's someone here today that you don't know, say hello to them. Be hospitable to them. Love on them. Agape, right? It's a choice. It's an act of the will. It's accompanied by emotion. and It leads to action on behalf of the object of that love. So let us love without hypocrisy. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we're just so grateful for your word, grateful for your truth. Lord, we pray uh, that you would do a work in this place today by your spirit, Lord, that you would remind us of the privilege that it is to be a part of your body. Lord, that you would lead us to be kindly affectionate to one another and brotherly love, uh, to be ministers of your grace, Lord, to bear with each other's burdens. We thank you for that privilege. Lord, we ask that you would bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's worship the Lord together.
Thank you, Jesus, that our sins are washed, Lord, that we are made white as snow. Although our sins were like scarlet, you make them white as wool, Lord, and it's by your blood that we're cleansed. It's because of the sacrifice that you made for us on the cross. Because you cried out, it is finished, Lord. There's nothing else that needs to be done. No debt needs to be paid, but we're free in you, Lord, that we're at peace with God. We've been rescued from the enmity that we were once in rescued from our sin. Thank you, Lord. Father, I ask that you would bless your church this week with your presence, Lord. I ask that you would fill them with your spirit as they go out of this place, Lord, that they would be able to be uh, good ambassadors for you, Lord, a witness of your mercy, a witness of your love. Uh, Lord, give them opportunities this week to share your gospel. Uh, Give them boldness in those opportunities, Lord. Remind them of their giftings. Lord, let them use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Don't forget the uh, cards, guys. Fill them out with your information. Put them in the offering box. That way we can get you on the directory. And until next week, you guys be blessed. I love you.